everyone. Thank you for coming along today. Welcome to this uh, workshop, Investigative Methods for the Skeptic. Uh, we've got a whole panel here of people, uh, very seasoned in, uh, in conducting investigations and uh, a lot of combined experience here. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to ask some questions and uh, everyone on the panel is going to answer them. Uh, my name's Karen Stoltzner. I'm one of the research fellows for the James Randi Educational Foundation. Uh, I'm also a co-host of the Monster Talk podcast. Um, so I'll just get everyone to introduce themselves briefly and then, then we'll start. I guess that would be me. Uh, I'm Brian Bonner. I'm with the Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society and Warning Radio. Matthew Baxter. I'm a paranormal claims investigator with Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society and uh, with Warning Radio. I'm Benjamin Radford, deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine and a uh, research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I'm uh, Blake Smith. I'm with IAG Atlanta and the Monster Talk podcast. I'm Ross Blotcher, a longtime member of the Independent Investigations Group and um, part of the Oh No, Ross and Carrie podcast. Hello, I'm Carrie Poppy. I'm the other half of the Ono Ross and Kerry podcast, and I'm also the communications director for the James Randi Educational Foundation. Well, thanks, everyone. So I grew up in Australia, and I feel like I've always been a skeptic, but I was curious to find out if everyone on the panel has always identified as being a skeptic or whether you be began out as a, a believer. So I'd just like to start with that question. I can't say that I've always identified as a skeptic. I've always had that mindset, but actually the label isn't something that came until later on. I definitely spent a lot of time being a believer. Uh, I grew up a believer. And uh, the, the problem is, is, is I actually had more than two brain cells to rub together and eventually found my way to skepticism. And uh, I, I really, really have to thank James Randi for that because I got to go back through his readings. And also, if anyone wants to pipe up at any time, it, we don't have to answer in a, a linear oh. fashion at all. Oh, one thing I do want to bring up. Uh, we're going to try to run this workshop a little bit like a skeptic camp. If any of you have been to a skeptic camp, that means that any time you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. You don't have to wait to the end. We're, we're ready all the time. There's actually a bribe here as well. <laughs> there is, but we won't bring it up just yet. Okay. All right, I'm going to break the linear format. I was very much a believer. I was raised a Bible-believing Christian, still kind of a chapter and verse guy. And, um, and yet I still managed to buy every ghost and alien encrypted book and believe almost everything I read in it. Uh, so definitely a believer for a long time until my college years. I'm going to cheat and say I've been both forever. Um, I think I was a skeptic when I was a believer. Like Ross, we both share a believer history, which is what made us friends originally. Um, but uh, even when I was a believer, I always cared about evidence, and I think I just didn't have all the evidence yet. Um, and that's something that I like to emphasize when talking to believers as well, that we need to treat them as, as thinking individuals just as we are. And, um, I, I think I became a, a full-blown skeptic after the Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, I think I'd taken things a little not very seriously and then decided to get to the bottom of stuff. And then found my tribe in about 2007. So for 10 years I was investigating and just trying to find answers for myself. And I'm really happy to find this sort of community where we can share information. It's nice. In my case, uh, I grew up uh, in my early teens uh, being sort of a, a dabbling believer or a dabbling skeptic. I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends on half empty, half full type thing. But, you know, I, I, I would read uh, books and magazines and I would see TV shows. You know, that's incredible, which dates me. And, and others here, um, and you know, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, all of us, Arthur C. Clarke, Strange World. And I would see these shows, and and they were all they were all presented very factually and authoritatively. But I never I noticed that that there was very little actual investigation. It was just sort of like somebody said, and we're just going to tell you these claims. And and I, I after a few years of that, I, I was saying, no, hold on, I'm not I'm not willing to accept somebody said. I want to know. I want to investigate. And so that's that's where when I turned from dabbling uh, skeptic or dabbling believer into more of a skeptic, deciding I wanted to decide for myself and find out you know, what, was, what was behind the claims. 
So I got started in investigations working with a, an organisation called the Australian Skeptics. I actually uh, began doing work experience with them and uh, they wanted me to, to play, I guess, a Matahari in a sense. And uh, I went to see a number of uh, alternative practitioners, an aura reader, a, a homeopath, uh, a naturopath and, and other practitioners. And uh, they, I, I had a consultation with all of them and they all told me I had a thyroid condition or some kind of problem with my liver. And so they all gave me diagnoses and then I went and uh, saw a, a medical practitioner afterwards who disconfirmed a lot of those. So that's how I got started as an investigator after that. Uh, I guess people would approach me and say, why don't you investigate this particular topic? And, and so it went on. So I'm curious to find out how, every, how everyone here became an investigator to begin with. What inspired you? How did you start? Well, for me, I was 11 years old when I first saw The Exorcist. <laughs> Needless to say, it scared the crap out of me. Now, uh, I believe that she was 13 in that movie when she was possessed by the devil, and I thought, okay, I'm 11 years old, I got two years. <laughs> so, I started studying everything I could find. And uh, through studying, you know, I thought, know your enemy. You know, try to find out everything you can about this, this, you know, these evil entities that are out there to get us all. And as I started reading, I started seeing, wait a minute, everybody's got conflicting information that they're putting forth as facts. Um, this didn't make sense. So pretty soon I figured out the only way I'm going to truly know about this stuff is if I get out there and investigate it myself and find out what the, tra the facts really are. Because I realized all I was reading was opinion. I was kind of the same way, but I really wanted to dive in and investigate firsthand what's going on, what are people witnessing. So I unfortunately decided I'd go out and get involved in the local research community. Uh, if anybody's done that, you know exactly where I'm going with this. It was a really bad experience because it was primarily a bunch of believers confirming what they were there to research. Uh, which kind of uh, forced me to start my own group. And luckily enough, I've had other people join me that have really helped throughout the years. Next. <laughs> hey. Um, so I really found skepticism through the Skeptic Society in Pasadena. Luckily, that was nearby, and I started attending those uh, lectures in college. And then I found that uh, CFI was also nearby, so there were a lot of resources and a community in Los Angeles. And there they had the Independent Investigations Group. And uh, having kind of recently discovered that I had been wrong about the world, or at least as I saw it, um, I was really excited that I could convert all my interest in these stories, uh, in these myths, and actually investigate them firsthand. And so uh, it was really through the independent investigations group that I started actively um, you know, testing paranormal claims. Um, this is where I pat James Randi on the back for the third time during this panel. Um, but I, I saw a homeopathy video that uh, Randi did um, back when I was taking homeopathy. And I was taking it for headaches, chronic headaches, and uh, my boyfriend at the time said, um, do you know what this stuff is? I just looked this up online, it's crazy. And sent me a link to a Randy video. And from there, I started thinking about all the other things that um, I had been trying that people had always told me didn't have evidence behind them. And I had never really listened to those people. Um, and something about that video just snapped in me and I, I uh, wanted to, to look into everything more and question on a deeper level. pass this thing around. I think I'm going to probably butcher his name, but um, when, when I was doing my investigations into UFOs, I did a UFO road trip after the Heaven's Gate cult tragedy and just decided to go see some of these places myself. And on the way, I stopped at a library in Gulf Breeze, Florida, and there was a book sale while I was there looking at evidence for uh, UFO information. And, and the book was uh, one of, was it Jan Harold Brunvand, if, if I said that right? And um, j that was my gateway doubt. That was, the, that was the, the, all these stories that I knew from my hometown were, you know, absolutely true. It suddenly found out that they were all just uh, urban legends. And, you know, if those really important foundation stories weren't true, what else wasn't true? And that's how I got here. So, I sort of had my, 
my uh, my introduction to it through more or less formalized skepticism um, through the the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and Skeptical Inquiry magazine. In fact, the very first skeptical piece I ever uh, read was once again uh, Randy's piece. Um, I was uh, long long story, but in in, in a nutshell, I, I was looking for beer in a dry county in Utah, <laughs> as one does. And um, and I happened to come across a used bookstore, and there in this used bookstore was a bunch of it was Mormon area, so it was you know how to live in your basement for 20 years and how to juggle five wives and all that. But beside that was an old copy of Skeptical Inquirer magazine in which uh, James Randi was doing a a beautifully eviscerating job at, at debunking Nostradamus. I'd never seen that before. I'd heard of Nostradamus, read about him, but I'd never seen anybody. Like take this point and say, "Oh my God, this is this is amazing stuff." And at that point, I went on. So, at that point, I got more involved in in, in uh, psychop at the time of what's now CSI. And so, I was fortunate enough to have predecessors like Randy and Joe Nickel, Ray Hyman, uh, Robert Schaefer, Phil Class, Richard Wiseman, uh, and others um, who I could you know sort of look at the history of of you know the the actual quasi formalized investigation and so I could sort of draw upon it from that so that's how I got into it. So I wanted to talk next about how we choose a topic or a theme and uh, often I just come across uh, anything that's in the local media, popular news stories at the time, uh, a lot of people approach me as well and say why don't you investigate this particular topic so how do you choose a topic guys, how do you choose a place to investigate? Well, it's easy for us because we have pushy Facebook fans who tell us what to investigate. <laughs> well, we have a long list, and uh, you put it all together, and we, we do a podcast once a month about a new investigation, and we have six, at least six years, six years of worth of material. There, there's no limit to the amount of societies to join, uh, alternative medicines to try. So, uh, yeah, no shortage. We kind of... Uh, we, we kind of fly under the radar, I guess, a little bit. Uh, what we do is we fool everybody by having a name like Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society. That means that all the believers call us and say, oh, you've got to come confirm this for us. Uh, so w we get phone calls. That's how we decide what we're going to investigate next. This morning. Yeah. I, uh, I have been doing a series I call things that scared the crap out of me as a kid. That's what really drives me. Uh, <laughs> and it's been very satisfying as an adult to find out these things aren't true. The big challenge for me is uh, when my kids ask me if something's true or not, do I just tell them or make them work it out themselves? So that's been a, an interesting question to deal with as a parent. So. In, in my case, uh, it, it, it's sort of half and half. Sometimes it's something that just piques my curiosity, for example. As many of you know, I, I researched the, the uh, chupacabra, vampire beast, uh, and that was just something that sort of fell in my lap. It was, I, there was a, a chupacabra sighting uh, not far from my house, actually, in New Mexico. And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> I've written about Bigfoot lake monsters. I can't ignore the blood-sucking vampire beast in my backyard, can I? Well, of course not. So sometimes they're just things where I'll see something, I'm like, this, this hasn't really been looked at or adequately examined. Other times, uh, you know, I, if it's like for a TV show or something, you're sort of thrown into the mix. So it's sort of a mix of uh, assigned things and, and uh, intellectual curiosity. And I think I've visited more psychics over the years than believers. Uh, and so I, I often write about psychics, I often write about ghosts. What are some topics that we can suggest to the audience for things that they can investigate? What are some ideas? I would just throw out there that if it's something that's interesting to you and, and you can find out whether or not it's a testable claim, that's the, the two things. You're going to need some passion because most of these things take time to investigate. And you need to know if it's something that can actually be solved because if it's not, it can be a huge time sink and you'll be an expert on something with no answer. So. I think in a large way it can be motivated by the people around you because we all have friends and family who believe in certain things and that's a good incentive for us to begin to investigate it, show them that we care enough to actually look into it and you know, try to arrive at an answer and spark those conversations. So I think that's how we can all be investigators. I think one of the tough things about uh, trying to decide what you're going to investigate is uh, you do have to look at what affects you as a skeptic? What's the thing that makes you the most angry half the time? 
uh, when you get these stories? Is it about uh, alternative medicine that maybe a family member is, is involved in? Uh, or is it uh, you see that video on the news, really important video of how a ghost visited a gym overnight and they caught it on the security camera, otherwise known as a spider crawling across the lens. Um, <laughs> You know, there's all kinds of things, and, it, and it's, it is kind of about your own passion. What really gets to you, and uh, how much time are you going to put into it? I mean, do you want to spend more time uh, collecting stamps or maybe getting to the bottom of one of these mysteries? Just, I would add that uh, I think it's really important that if you do become an investigator and do this work, find a home for it besides just blogging about it. Uh, get it published. Submit it to Skeptical Inquirer, Skeptic Magazine, wherever you can get it published. And uh, use it because if you get it published, people can use it to update Wikipedia. You can't usually use your own first-person research to fix Wikipedia. But if you get it published in a magazine that can be cited, then you can help make the world a smarter place. So. And for my part, I'll just actually echo what, what Matthew said. Um, you have to care about these things. You have to care, you have to take them seriously. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I've learned over the years is that you can't dismiss these things. You can't ridicule them. You have to take them seriously. And when you're looking for tops to investigate, take something that you're willing to spend weeks or months or years researching, because it may take that long. Um, you know, on TV and the Ghost Hunters, you know, the mysteries are solved in 43 minutes. In real life, uh, investigations, I mean, all of us have stories that, you know, these things can last months and years. And if you're not willing to put in the effort, and if you don't, if you don't care enough to see, the, see it through and do a thorough investigation, then, then you shouldn't be investigating it. So I mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, in all of those suggestions, no one really suggested uh, uh, investigating cemeteries. And as we've all seen on ghost hunters and ghost adventures, they always visit cemeteries. It just seems to be a, a stereotype. So should we be investigating cemeteries, guys? It's a dead end. <laughs> <laughs> now, who didn't expect that out of him? Um, uh, one thing I would say about cemeteries, it's, uh, it, it's kind of funny. Because, well, first off, when we go to investigate something, we try to at least investigate something that has a claim. Cemeteries don't have a claim. Uh, the, the things that are often said about cemeteries is, uh, or, or when people die, oh, they'll usually haunt somewhere that they're emotionally attached to, or they'll haunt somewhere where they were actually killed, or if there's high emotion, this and that. All the th reasons why a place is supposed to be haunted has nothing to do with the cemetery. Um, so that's, that's one reason not to, but most cemeteries don't even have a claim associated. And that's one differentiation is don't go just investigating willy-nilly, investigate the claim. And uh, if there's not a claim associated, don't waste your time. We certainly don't need to make new urban legends. Yeah. <laughs> Although we've tried. Yeah, we have tried. So where to begin then? What's a, the first step in investigating a claim? Yeah, it, 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 figuring out exactly what the claim is is really a big, big step. If there is a claim if to there, begin if with, there is as a well. claim to be made. But I mean, that's the thing. You you can't test a vague story. You need to know specifically what the claim is. And I guess like one one example is like I, I personally have experienced something that before I learned all the underpinnings of it, I, I would have easily said it was a haunting. It seemed like a haunting. Um, and until I learned about sleep paralysis and what actually was causing the phenomena, I was pretty sure something was crawling in my bed and attacking me. Um, so that was the claim, right? Okay, I felt like something was attacking me. That, that's a, a very specific thing that can be tested, and it turns out with a little bit of research, there's an explanation. But if, if you just, you know, people heard noises of somebody walking upstairs, well, that's a claim, you know. But the problem is people collect a series of little individual events and turn the whole thing into a haunting. This door opens by itself. I hear noises upstairs. Each one of these events can be tested by itself, and they don't necessarily accumulatively prove anything. So I think that's an important idea to keep in mind. You've got to break it down. Don't investigate a haunting. Investigate the underlying claims. Well, the other big thing here is you might be investigating not necessarily a haunting in your neighborhood, but maybe something that's historical, um, something that's got some big stories behind it and everything. Now, when you get to these kind of things, or when we're talking about alternative medicine, or we're talking about psychics, uh, anything with a bigger name than just in your neighborhood, always make sure 
uh, to find out if anyone has already investigated it that you trust. And then you can go back and see what they've done. And it's always much better if you can stand on the shoulders of giants. It makes you look a lot better. Um, make sure you reference them if you have it published anywhere, the work that they did, and then talk about the work that you did. But always look first to see who's investigated it before you and what kind of work that they did. Uh, and often there comes claims after those. Uh, the urban legends will continue to grow. So you can make your focus on what's been said since they've investigated it. So there's a couple of different ways to approach that. Yeah, I would just say, uh, following up on that, is that, you know, the, to my mind, the big issue is scholarship. Uh, it, it's amazing to me, even after all these years, when I see someone allegedly investigating a claim, whether it's a ghost or something else, and they've done no work at all. Their, their, their idea of investigating a haunted house is walking around in the dark with a flashlight. Seriously, that's, <laughs> to them, that's what we're investigating. Are you? Because it looks like you're walking around in a, in a house with a flashlight. Well, no, we're investigating. And they just don't have a, the faintest clue, I mean, in terms of what exactly the claims, isolating the claims, what, you know, what did people experience, were the other people who investigated this. Um, and it, there's, just, there's just no scholarship at all. And so, I, as, as Dan Loxton uh, pointed out um, to me many times, is that oftentimes a mystery can be solved simply by, by doing basic research like grade school level checking original sources research. Uh, and that's, you know, that's important to remember. With a paranormal claim, someone who says that they have some sort of ability, um, in my experience with the IIG, oftentimes the first step is just to get a claim. They'll be making a lot of very broad statements, uh, you know, kind of alluding to their abilities, you know, bold statements, but you say, that's great, but what can you do? What quantifiably can you do? And so trying to get at a testing procedure, you know, something that uh, actually tests their claim is often difficult and will take months of back and forth. Anyone else want to add anything at all? Well, moving on, is there a difference between research and investigation at all in your eyes? Oh, sure. I'm sorry? Is it, it's not is it quantifiable or verifiable? It's not quantifiable, you're saying, right? Or verifiable? No, they say it's not quantifiable. They say their power is not quantifiable. Sure. Well, then you say, well, you know, this is the this is the method that we use to test, and we really need something that can be shown to work. And we'll, we'll try to work with them, but if we can't do something, we say, well, you may have this ability, but there's no way for us to test it unless there's something that you can do as a result. So going back again, is there a difference between research and investigation? Is it the same thing? Uh, is investigation possibly more on-site and research more armchair skepticism? I, I, would, I would make exactly that distinction, Karen, is, is to my mind, you know, if, when I do an investigation, to my mind, the, the first half of it is the research. You know, what are the claims behind it? Because you, you can do all the claims about something up until the point when you actually go investigate. So in some cases, if you're doing like field research, you might go to a lake where there's a lake monster. You might go to, you know, a haunted house, whatever, what, depending on what the claim is. So you can do all the research and the background information. Or, because the thing is, if you don't do the background preparation, then if you're on site doing an investigation, you don't know what to make of it. If, if, you're, if you're trying to investigate, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're in a haunted house or something and you're hearing some sort of weird sound, if you haven't done the research to find out that that is one of the claims about that place, then, you need, then, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be effective because you don't, you don't know, you, you have to, you have to know the questions to ask in order to get the right answers would be how to summarize that. Yeah, and I think to some extent that's a semantics question because you've, you've got to do research uh, to be an investigator, but you don't have to be an investigator to do research. So you, if you look at like people who read paranormal literature, to some extent they're doing research. They're learning about the background and the stories that, that make up the, the body of paranormal uh, lit, if you want to call it that. The, uh, the thing is, it's taking those stories and then trying to figure out whether or not they're true. That's where you break off from just being a researcher to actually investigating. And of course, that's all just talking about, uh, you know, say historical research, not experimental. That's another avenue altogether. But uh, one of the things I've noticed is that the paranormal literature is, is pretty much an echo chamber. And one of the easiest things you could do if you want to be an arm scare, arm scare? Armchair skeptic, <laughs> I guess scare, I don't know. If you want to be an armchair skeptic but actually get some work done, you can go back to the paranormal literature and try to track it back to the original source. 
if you can get back to the primary sources, you can usually find information that gets lost in the replication of stories that happens. Because as these stories grow over time, they get embellished and new details are added, which is not really, uh, well, that's indicative that something's being created. I, I would just say that. So, Blake, you're the only person I know that can accidentally pun. Yeah. <laughs> it was very nicely done. Um, I, I really do think it's a, the difference between research and investigation can often, and, and this is something everybody needs to be aware of and be aware of, is uh, that it's often just in the context. You know, if someone says, I'm a paranormal researcher, well, it means the same damn thing as if they're a paranormal investigator. Uh, it's, the, the words can be very interchangeable, and um, I think it's probably a better idea for the most part is just to do as much as you can do throughout the process of whatever it is you want to research or investigate and not worry about the words themselves so much. Yes? I am interested in this uh, paranormal investigation that you do. Now, I've seen on the science fiction channel, I think people forget it's science fiction, but you know some of this, I've watched like one or two shows. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can everybody hear the question? No, okay. She, she's basically, okay, yeah, say it. Stand up again and scream it. No. Um, the, uh, she's asking about like the, the shows like Ghost Hunters. Um, why is it that they never seem to have very specific claims, uh, very specific reasons for why something is a ghost? Is that, is that basically it? Okay. Right, so if an EMF detector suddenly shifts by several milligauss, that means it's a ghost. Why do they do that? Is that what we're looking at? Okay. How does that prove it's a ghost? How do they know in the first place? How do they know in the first place? This is a great question, and I'm going to let Brian answer it. Oh. <laughs> Gee, uh, the big answer is, how do they know that it is what they're claiming it is? They absolutely do not. Uh, most people in the field that are using any type of equipment, regardless of what the equipment is, really don't have any idea what it was designed to do. And if you're going to be out doing any type of investigation with any equipment, be it a camera, be it some high-tech device, don't assume that you know how to use it. Take a class on how to use it, and I do not mean a ghost hunting class. If, <laughs> if it says ghost hunting and class in the same thing, save your $100 and go to the bar. It's a lot better. But the thing is, it's for, as they say, entertainment purposes only. These people do not have a clue. They wouldn't know science or research if it came out and said boo to them. So, unfortunately, you've, you've pretty much got the right outlook. They don't know. Yeah, we call those investigations with scare quotes around them. But, you know, they're using these placeholder terms that don't mean anything. Uh, ectoplasm, what does that mean? You know, who could even define what that would be, let alone what it is? It's the opposite of endoplasm. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected. And uh, toxins, you know, what is, what is a toxin? Can you define that for me? Uh, there is a real meaning of the word toxin, but not in the way it gets used many no. times. But I think, I, I think this, um, this habit uh, that we all have as humans, and we see particularly in believers as most obvious, is that when we don't understand something, we want to attribute it to agency. And um, that's actually kind of good news for investigators and skeptics, because for a lot of these people, if you provide a solid alternative hypothesis, that removes the mystery, and they no longer have to attribute it to an, an, an agent they can't see. Question out here. Well, I was going to say, and also, uh, don't ever forget that the point of television shows in general is to entertain and not to teach. So. No, it's to make money for the advertisers. Well, by well, means of potato chips, right? So. But, but we are getting the new thing that we like to refer to as the TV-trained investigators, yeah. which means that they've watched a television show about how to go out and ghost hunt, and now they feel that they're well-trained and co -out, they can go out and do this type of thing. And I always compare that to, well, you've watched a couple episodes of House, let's go do some surgery. 
it's just not something you can do. I've but always we, said we should start a new show called Anomaly Hunters because that's what you're doing. You're going looking for anything that just seems weird or out of place, and oh, that confirms my presupposition. That's one of the only names that's not open, so get ready. It'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> The question is, how is it that Ghost Hunters and all these shows keep getting renewed? Uh, how is it that they, they still re retain their popularity? Ben? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> I was hoping you were going to pitch that one to me. Uh, I think there's a couple answers. One of them is that, uh, that the Ghost Hunters give the illusion of success. Uh, very, uh, unless you can see right through, which everybody on this panel can, but to, to many people in the audience, uh, to, to, to them, success, a successful ghost hunt means that you saw, you know, ooh, look at this video. Look, there's something, something, a piece of light, you know, flashes over here. And to them, like, there you go. What more do you want? There you go. You see the light? There you go. Um, but seriously, I mean, to them, that's, that is, to, they, they believe they're making progress. Um, by any, any objective, certainly skeptical standard, they're just repeating themselves, and, and every now and then they'll, they'll throw in new technology, new gadgets. They'll get like, you know, instead of a, a device that has like four lights, it'll have like six lights. Or it'll be, have a green light, you know, that'll flash now and then. It, it's, it's all good fun. Uh, but, but the problem is the audience uh, are often fooled into thinking that they're actually doing something. Like, oh yeah, we solved that case. And it always baffled me. I mean, you, you see these ghost owners, they go to a place and... And they spend, you know, a couple hours overnight there. And then, well, we solve that, and they, and they drive away. I'm thinking, well, hold on here. If you really, truly believe that you found, like, scientific hard evidence of a haunted house, you're just going to walk away? It's like a, a real scientist would be like, I'm parking here. We're staying here for weeks and months and years until we solve this, instead of, oh, okay, we're done. Oh, this is another episode wrapped up. What's next? No, if they had actually, truly found good scientific evidence of some sort of, you know, ghostly anomalies, they would be there, um, you know, uh, until until it was solved. So, and the other thing is, of course, that um, that it, you know, it's just it's one of those popular shows, and that they're going to keep it on the air as long as it's making money. And you know, there you go. Well, yeah. you know, your comment about the equipment—it's getting even worse now because the teams that you're seeing on television and many teams out in the wild are starting to make their own equipment. So we're having devices made by people who don't have a clue what the equipment was supposed to do. And now they're making things specifically built to find ghosts. And there is a huge, huge market for these types of device. A uh, good example, we have somebody local to us that on average is going about $30,000 a month in selling equipment specifically devised to find ghosts. And his website does say for entertainment purposes only. Yes, it does. <laughs> He's very entertained. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, is, that, is that great? I mean, if, if that's not immoral, that's not like a great thing to do. <laughs> it, is, it is very difficult um, in some senses uh, from, from our standpoint, knowing what we could get away with knowing that we, we, could, we could make a ton of money. We really could, but uh, we just have this stupid ethical thing that gets in the way. Yeah, so. we, we just found out about people selling items on eBay as haunted. Haunted dolls, haunted jewelry. Well, there's a haunted collector. Has anyone seen that on television? New series of oh, that is coming out that's soon. that's so painful. Grandpa steals things from houses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting what Ben was saying before about uh, the investigation just seeming to be done when they've discovered there is a ghost and they just leave, uh, it, it does seem very strange. How many people have seen this new show, Uf UFO Chasers? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a brilliant show. Uh, one of the stars on the show, uh, she's, she calls herself the Skeliever because she's a skeptical believer. It's a new you one. Come up with that. Yes, <laughs> isn't that adorable? Yeah. Um, now, the thing is, is she's, uh, they want to go out and catch UFOs, so they're out on this hilltop at night, and she gets a little bit of a lens flare and a reflection, and she flips out. There's all kinds of bleeping because she's, you know, what the murder is that? You know, and all that kind of stuff, and screaming. And uh, she says, the minute I filmed that, this investigation was over. <laughs> That's just a great example of how ridiculous this well, is. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, your, your question about why this, you know, why are these shows still successful? It, there, 
the formats themselves are now really kind of cookie cutter. So you got like the, uh, you went from ghost chasing to finding Bigfoot. And now there's uh, what UFO chasers. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems like a really simple package for a producer to put together. And now they can just and go in really and pitch cheap. it. It's like ghost hunters, but with Bigfoot. It's got, it's like finding Bigfoot, but with UFOs. So, you know. And the, 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 the actors, because they are, most of these shows are scripted, get paid nothing. Yeah. And there's, there's no sets they have to pay for. So it's incredibly cheap to produce reality shows. So as long as they can make more money than they spend, which is really easy, then it's no problem. Uh, back in the days of like ER, when they were paying uh, George What's-His-Face uh, several million an episode, those days are gone. So now it's very cheap TV. They can make a lot of money. They're not going to stop. Yes. Um, I, yeah, he wanted us to talk about some of the more bizarre and humorous claims we've investigated. Don't and get them I, started. I, 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 yeah, we've got so many. Um, and I know everyone on this, this uh, panel does. I'm waiting. We, we might want to, do we want to go through the rest of the questions first, maybe address a few things if we have time? Um, I know you take it now. Um, oh, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I had that coming. Wow, and we're off. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll try to make this quick. Uh, some of the interesting ones, we had one... Um, how many saw our little hijacking last year when we did the investigating the investigators? Okay, we got a few people. I'll try to bring you up to date on it very quickly. We decided we were going to punk another paranormal group. <laughs> now, that's a mean way of saying it. What we actually were wanting to do was get real documentation on how these other groups operate. So we had Karen pretend like she was the fiance of Rich Orman. Rich, will you stand up? <laughs> Okay. We know where he is. See, now Rich, you'll, you'll learn this about Rich, he is an a-hole. <laughs> and, and you'll see that throughout Tam. Um, now, the thing is, is, is we used Rich's house, uh, one of those instances where he wasn't an a-hole. He let us use his house and he was absolutely wonderful. Uh, we, we rigged it with cameras and everything. Obvious, hanging right out in the middle of, of nowhere. It just You could tell the place was totally bugged. Um, and uh, we had Karen call up and say, I'm really scared. I live in San Francisco. I want to move out here with my fiance, but there's something weird about the house. I don't trust it. Could you come investigate? So Brian and I, we go upstairs where we can, you know, uh, stick ourselves in a room and monitor their activities. They come in the house and everything is a ghost. They don't even notice the cameras hanging everywhere, recording them. They can't find the two of us in the room upstairs. In the same house. <laughs> now, now, we did a little bit of the Project Alpha thing where we said if they asked, is this a hoax, is this, you know, we were going to be honest. It was going to be like Project Alpha. We were going to come out and be completely honest. As long as they didn't ask, we were going full speed ahead. Blah, blah, blah. Fast forward. These guys think they've got the most haunted house they've ever found. We set nothing up. There was no hoaxing of any kind. But they had all these EVPs uh, of all this, you know, ghostly activity and, and uh, uh, proof that a ghost was wanting to choke Karen. Um, and I think that was just Rich. Uh, I was wanting to choke him. But yeah, I think it's actually she wanted to choke him. That's you're right. Uh, so they got so freaked out that they called in another paranormal group to help out. Guess not. who they called? <laughs> So, yeah. Well, yeah, well, that was the thing, is one of their pieces of equipment wasn't working, so Rich actually called us upstairs to ask us if we could help them fix it. We did. The whole time he thinks this whole thing is so stupid that we are hoaxing him, and he was convinced of that the whole time. Well, needless to say, we came in, and we had to write the most ridiculous ritual ever made up because we didn't want them to say, you know, if we just got one online, you know, of someone else's ritual for cleansing a house, then they could say, well, you may not have believed it, but you spoke the words, and that's why it worked. So we made up something completely ridiculous based on a Scottish Gaelic lesson on how to ask someone how old they are. Um, <laughs> and I spoke it in a deep voice saying it was actually ancient Sumerian. Um, we had the guy, the paranormal investigator, place Fruit Loops around the house. <laughs> Because Fruit Loops had the, the primary colors, they were circular, there was all this reasoning on why this was going to work. 
Um, Rich's dogs would follow him and eat the Fruit Loops as he put them down. It was really well done. So, needless to say, um, I did a little bit of, uh, you, know, you know, like you got a guy that get, takes like six months of karate lessons. He's probably the most dangerous guy in the world because he doesn't know what he's doing. Wyatt well, had some hypnosis training and uh, should not have done it. <laughs> and uh, Banachek will uh, uh, also confirm this, um, <laughs> that I should not have done this. But I hypnotized the guy uh, into thinking he was possessed by this demon. And he carried the demon with him out of the house and then I released him. So, unethical, oh God, yes. <laughs> Funny, yes, very, it was hilarious. So that makes it okay. Um, so anyway, I released the demon from him. Now this guy to this day still believes all of this. We've published this everywhere we can think of. We've given lectures. Uh, we've done everything short of just telling him to his face. The reason we can't tell him to his face is because he knows where Rich lives. <laughs> And we know he's spent time in prison. So we're not going to release him on Rich. That's just, we, we feel very badly about that. Bull. So he still calls me up, and he calls me up two nights ago because there's a family being raped by a demon. And, and he wants us to come help. Now, this isn't, this isn't funny. I mean, the several ones, we, we exposed this man for how dangerous he is by doing this original investigation. You know, by, by documenting how dangerous he is to families that believe that there's something in their home. Because he comes in, he comes in and confirms it and everything else. So when he got released back into the wild again, he goes to another house where there's domestic violence going on. And he basically makes it okay for them because there's a demon in their house that's causing them to behave this way. So now the man who uh, has a, a broken wrist from uh, trying to beat his wife now can say the devil made me do it, it's okay. Um, so we had to go in and, and basically put a stop to that because he's like, oh, this is like the Amityville house over there. No, we walked in, the house was fine. There was trouble in the marriage. So we tried to get them counseling. We tried to have them understand that there was no spiritual thing involved here. It was take responsibility for your own actions. And now we've got a house where they believe they're being molested by a demon on a nightly basis. And uh, spent an hour talking to this woman last night, and I had nothing but nightmares last night trying to figure out how we're going to deal with this and how we're going to get this family thinking correctly again. And uh, so be aware, paranormal investigation isn't as romantic as it always seems. Well, and one thing to add to that is you would think, wow, this guy's kind of a, a, an odd person in the field. This is a really, really far out type of group. This last case that he's talking about here that we were just contacted about, there have been three other groups in this home that have also confirmed this for them. This so is the norm. it is the norm. It is not anything that's an anomaly in the field. So on a, on a quick lighter note before I pass this on, uh, he's trying to send me all the EVPs he got in this house. Now, I want everybody in this audience to be fully aware EVPs are the biggest load of crap ever invented by these people, and they use it as their main source of evidence. Uh, it, they've been debunked time and time again. We don't need to do it again here. But he's trying to send me all these files. And finally, he sends me an email so it says, titled, Problems, Bro. And he says, uh, he's like, I can't understand it. I've been trying to send you these EVPs, but I got this message back that says, email or demon. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. No way. They don't want you to have these, man. <laughs> WTF. So oh, poor dear. I have tears coming from my eyes at this point. So I write him back, this is serious. <laughs> Let's try this. Break them up into smaller emails and title them all cute puppies. <laughs> that way we can get under the demon radar. Sure enough, within the half hour, I've got an email, cute puppies. Wow. And I'm not, I'm not intentionally making fun of these guys, these people. This is, it's, it's accidental. It just happens. I, you were asking about entertaining investigations, and uh, for the podcast, uh, oh no, Ross and Carrie will uh, always kind of do that undercover investigation where we go in sort of as believers and just ask 
questions, open-ended questions, try to get them to talk about what it is they believe and what they do. And, and so just out of that experience, we get a lot of really fun stories. Uh, just a few months ago, we were here in Vegas because we were joining the Raelian UFO cult. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but the idea is that uh, we were seated on this planet by an intelligent race of um, the Elohim, these aliens on another planet. Where did they come from, you ask? Another race, and it goes on ad infinitum. And uh, so we got our baptisms here in the desert, and uh, it's, it's an amazing story. So that would be one of the more uh, fun uh, fun investigations, but Carrie wants to talk about one we haven't even publicized yet. Yeah, you're the first audience to hear about this, but it's just so good. So <laughs> we went to get exercised a few months ago. We went to, I can't tell you who, but we went to an exorcism specialist, and, um, and I told them that I was concerned that I uh, was possessed. Um, and my evidence was only that I took a, a quiz they had online where you could find out exactly how possessed you are. And it said that I had like like a 48% chance of being possessed and or something like that. And you answered it honestly. And I did, yeah. I said everything exactly true to life. And uh, so I brought it in. Of course, I had paid $10 to take this online quiz. And I printed it out and I said, you know, it, it says I have a pretty good chance of being possessed. What do you think? And, um, and so they had one of their specialists uh, stand next to me, kind of push me up against the wall a little bit. And Ross was watching and, um, and she, she looked me square in the eye and she said, who are you? <laughs> and I said, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, I, um, I'm seeing if I'm possessed. And I was just answering everything completely honestly, and nothing was happening, where, whereas there were people all around us flailing about and falling on the floor. And she said that I was the hardest case of possession she had ever seen. <laughs> M meanwhile, behind us, while we're having this kind of like conversation, I'm hearing blah, 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 from other people. Uh, and uh, it was in a room that looked not unlike this one, actually, very yeah. similar. Yeah. That reminds me, we've got Bob Larson visiting soon in Denver. We're going to go and see him and, uh, okay. and look at his methods. Uh, so I think a strange investigation that I've been doing that's uh, kind of ongoing, has anyone heard of Bratso at all? Bratso the gazer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's touring the States, he's living in Hawaii, and uh, basically he's a spiritual healer, uh, but he doesn't claim that he's a spiritual healer. So uh, he basically people make claims about him. So there are lots of uh, testimonials and anecdotal evidence that he creates uh, miracles and brings good luck to people. He can fix people's cars, do all kinds of things. If you go and attend one of his, one of his sessions where he stares at you, he gazes at you. So uh, these sessions last about 10 minutes a time. And uh, he'll do sessions throughout the day. He'll basically stand on a podium and just look across the room. You want, you want to see an example of what it looks like? We'll do it for free. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> we need the music, though. It's just yeah, it's really, really soft music is playing. <laughs> <laughs> this goes on for 15 minutes. 10 minutes. It felt like a day. Yeah. <laughs> That's enough, that's enough. Well, yeah, and, that's so, a, and that's a good point. Meanwhile, there's, there's literally people bursting into tears in the audience. It, oh, just yeah, low sobbing coming from everywhere. I call him the, the silent evangelist because he doesn't even speak. Uh, although his voice, to hear his voice, it's healing. So at the end of the session, they play a snippet of his, uh, him talking, but he's Croatian. So uh, you're only hearing Croatian, but people believe that they can understand what he's saying and... Uh, all kinds of very, very strange claims about this, but um, he states, or his handlers state, that he doesn't make any claims, so this just seems to be the perfect rort. You cannot look directly into his gaze at you for more than seven seconds, um, or your head will explode. And they stated very clearly that under 18, it can be very dangerous. Or I, I pregnant was very, women. Or pregnant women, yes. I was very foolhardy. I brought my 17-year-old son. Um, with me, he, he did survive. Um, but yeah, Karen and I, we were standing next to each other, and we had tears in our eyes as well. Uh, of, just so you of know, of laughter. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd say. And Rich. 
What's oh, he, he's also selling Barry. amulets. Uh, he sells all kinds of jewellery, uh, including a pendant for three thousand dollars. Actually, it's gone up to seven thousand dollars now. I would say so. He's yeah, uh, earning he, a. We calculated he's about not 35. Janet Jackson, but yeah, he makes a lot of money. That's <laughs> we calculated he's earning about thirty-five thousand dollars a day for doing these sessions. Uh, just real quick, in terms of uh, particularly unusual or interesting cases, the, the only one that jumps to my mind immediately is um, uh, anybody hearing about the, the Popobawa, the skeptic raping bat demon? <laughs> it's not funny, seriously. It is kind of funny. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird bat demon type creature that is uh, seen primarily in, in, uh, in East Africa in, on the island of Zanzibar. And I read about it um, about three or four years ago, and then I ended up going on a when I, on a, when I was on a trip to uh, to Kenya in East Africa. I ended up doing investigation there, and I interviewed people. And it turns out that this this weird creature uh, attacks m primarily men at night and and rapes them. Um, and uh, I did a whole investigation. It was actually published in Forty and Times magazine uh, a couple years back. If anyone was interested, but that was one of the weirder ones. Um, and I remember when I was when I was talking to my informants, because uh, most of the people there, uh, most of the people I needed to talk to uh, spoke Kiswahili. Uh, some spoke English, but others didn't. And so I had to sort of at, get a translator. And they said, "Well, you know what? Rape skeptics, right?" I was like, "Yeah, you're skeptical." Yeah. He's like, "I think you're okay." Uh, and, and I was, I was. I'll just say I was. Uh, so I don't want to give give it away. But uh, it was actually interesting. It turned on. It, it, it turned out that um, that it actually derived a little bit from uh, from the Quran because many of the people there are Muslim. And uh, and as far as I could tell in my in my research, it was actually a derivation of the genies that you find in the Quran. So anyway, uh, there will be an upcoming uh, Monster Talk podcast. So on that. Ben, was that something like Queen Mab syndrome, where they have a sleep disorder? Or? Yes and no. I actually tied it in with the, the old hag. Yeah, the, the old hag syndrome. You know, the the succubus, and you know, the, there's there's elements. Well, it's it's a long, complicated story, but basically, there's elements of social control and also elements of of uh, sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. um, so Monster Talk. But you know, MonsterTalk.org. One other thing, and it's not necessarily the investigation, but a thing that we really get a lot of uh, backlash from is once we've done an investigation, the reaction from either the people that were involved or the, let's say, business owners of places that we've been to, the combination of places that we've been kicked out of permanently and death threats that we've received, we could wallpaper a house with. And that is all part of being an investigator. It's just you're going to make a lot of people very angry if you tell the truth. One of the most horrible things that's happened to us, and I know we're going to get a whole lot of awes out of this, um, is we've been banned from the Stanley Hotel. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know. We'll tell you that story later. <laughs> there was a, a question in the back over here. Wendy. If I understood the question correctly, it was basically how do you deal with people who have paranormal claims but may be mentally ill? Okay. Yeah, everybody Baxter. Looks, nope. Everybody looks at me. Thanks. Yeah, you've had a lot of experience We've with it. Doing that lately, so. Yeah, being mentally ill myself, I'm able to speak on this. Um, Brian and I also 
do some work uh, helping Banachek uh, with the million dollar challenge uh, claimants. And let's, let's face it, while we would love to find somebody that's got some, some authentic powers, I mean, how cool would that be, really? This is the whole reason we want to investigate all this stuff. It's just, there, there's an off chance. It's so small we can't even calculate it, sure. But uh, wouldn't it make the world a whole lot more interesting if uh, there was some sort of uh, power like this that we could actually identify and grow science from it? That would be great. Well, the problem is, is if they've got a mental illness, um, it's, it's always been interpreted you know, by some, you know, that they have some kind of power. Uh, we often try to employ uh, extra help, you know, on the outside. We have uh, a couple of psychiatrists that we can call and stay in contact with while we're interacting with this person. I have to admit, one of the things that I was really worried about, you've got all these challenges out there, there's quite a few of them around the globe that offer a, a prize if they can prove some sort of paranormal power. Well, my concern started to be with a, a particular uh, claimant here recently, and, and if anybody's going to be here for Sunday night's Million Dollar Challenge, you'll get to hear more about this. Um, but one of my big concerns is, aren't we feeding into this man's delusion? And isn't that dangerous? Isn't that not exactly helpful for him? You know, isn't that hurting his mental health further by feeding into this delusion and, and walking along with him? And the psychiatrist that we spoke to said, well, no, any good psychiatrist isn't going to just shut him down. You know, if, if he talked to God today, he's going to say, well, what did God say to you? And he's going to give this man an opportunity to realize on his own that he's got a problem. And he said, the psychiatrist told us that actually all these challenges are actually pretty healthy for these people with mental illnesses because we're people that will actually listen to them will actually listen to what they have to say and give them an opportunity to prove it. And when they can't prove it to, to us and they can't prove it to themselves anymore, they'll often seek some other help. So it does turn out that these things can be very helpful for these people. Did that answer your question at all? Okay, thank you. I, I'd like to speak to that too real quick. I once thought that I was being haunted in my house when I was a bit younger. And, um, and I was convinced of it. I guess we had a similar situation. You were the one who spoke about being haunted as well, right? Um, yeah, and I, I heard all these noises, and I felt like a weird pressure on my chest and shoulders. And all these people were reinforcing it for me by taking it too seriously, by telling me, okay, well, burn sage in your house and tell the spirit to leave. And it just made me more scared. And then one day, someone said to me, well, have you ever heard about carbon monoxide poisoning? <laughs> and, and that's what it was. There was wow. a gas leak in my house. Wow. And I had been slowly being poisoned for a number of weeks. Wow. So, I mean, the best way to get trapped in a mental illness, or you know, whether it's temporary or long term, is to be convinced that it's not a mental illness. So I think that's part of why this work is so important. I guess this feeds into a question that I had, an ethical question. Should we really be doing residential hauntings, doing investigations of them? I've uh, rarely done that myself. I've been, I know, Ben, you've done one particular case in New York, I think it was. Uh, but should we be doing that? Is that a good thing to do? Uh, that's a great question and sort of ties in with, you know, what is our role as investigators? I mean, we're not, we're not psychotherapists. Um, you know, we're investigators. And, you know, typically investigations, at least what I found is that oftentimes there's definitely a psychological element to it where you're, you're, you end up being a counselor whether you want to or not in some cases. Um, in, in the case that Karen's talking about, I did an investigation in, um, in Buffalo, New York, and it's, a, it's, it's one of the chapters in my investigations book. I won't go into it now. But in that particular case, I was called in because there was a family uh, who, who were convinced their house was haunted. And they had spoken to uh, ghost hunters, and they had spoken to a psychic who both confirmed this. And they were scared. They were scared to sleep in their own house at night. And it wasn't until they came to Psychop and, and me, who took the time to go to their house and investigated, that I... Through my methodical investigation, I showed them that their house was not, in fact, haunted, and and that was that was the case I'm particularly proud of because uh, it helped real people. This wasn't some abstract. Ooh, we're talking about ghosts. These were concrete people who were genuinely and sincerely terrified to sleep in their own house at night. And it, and, and after all the bullshit that the 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 the, the, uh, the psychics and the ghost hunters put them through uh, to to get a skeptical point of view, that 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 you know, in my particular case, it it uh, it reassured them. So I think um, you know if you can provide a, 
a, a, a service to them and you can help calm their fears, uh, that's, you know, that can't do anything but, but good. And that does make it really difficult when there's been previous teams that have gone in and just exacerbated the problem. Um, that really makes it rough. Uh, we've had uh, families that, uh, what one uh, elderly woman was convinced that there was a bunch of children ghosts uh, in one of uh, uh, the vacant rooms in her house. Then she would go in and, and basically imagine these little children coming and sitting on her lap. And uh, we were now put in the position of having to explain to her that there wasn't anything there. And uh, there, there was no evidence of anything, even though all the other ghost hunting groups that had been in there had confirmed it all for her, that there were, they had even named the ghosts for her. Um, so it, it gets really difficult. And uh, you get into bad situations when you go into these residential places because often, if you are a help to them, they start to rely on you. And they start to call you daily with every little worry that they have because now you're their savior. And that gets really sticky. And then often you get cases where suddenly they'll start accusing you. Uh, it's a lot like uh, these conferences. They'll start accusing you of sexual harassment. Uh, they'll start uh, uh, making all kinds of bizarre uh, claims against you when you decide you're going to stop helping them and stop being for them there every day. So there's a lot to think about when you're going to go into a residential place. On the flip side, we've got the businesses. They love to be haunted because it brings them more business. So we got to look at the ethics of that. Do we want to investigate these businesses? That's a personal, uh, personal decision that everybody, I think, has to make. Yeah, I, was, I just want to add that it, 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 a lot of people who are having these experiences, some people are terrified, and you, you should be sympathetic and try to understand that. And the other side of it is people may have an investment in those beliefs that you may not understand from a skeptical perspective. So solving the mystery is great, but then actually presenting that and convincing someone else that, that your solution is the right one may be harder than you would expect and maybe not even appropriate depending on the circumstances. Sorry, just work through that out. <laughs> is, is, this a, is this a living or a sideline for you? Well, Ben is rich anyway, <laughs> so he can afford to do this. Um, uh, for the most part, I think a lot of us, uh, we just do it as a very expensive, and I hate to use the word, but hobby. It's, it's, a, very, it's a passion. It really is. We, we love to get out there. We love to solve these mysteries, but we love to help people when we can. Um, it's a really important thing for us, uh, but it's very expensive, and yeah, we make nothing off of it most of the time. So, and I've got affiliations, or I've had affiliations with all of the major organisations in this country and in Australia. So occasionally they'll pitch in and assist and uh, give me some funding. Most often I'm out of pocket very severely, and I've really been an independent investigator for two decades, and so uh, it is a. a a very passionate hobby, but a full-time hobby, I guess, yeah. in many I, ways. I have Monster Talk t-shirts available across the <laughs> hall. <laughs> yeah, um, onopodcast.com slash donate. We've had very generous donors, and, and actually we have kind of an ethical issue there because we'll uh, give money to practitioners of various alternative remedies and you know various other groups that we wouldn't normally want to help fund. Yeah, and so we have this deal that we won't tip them, which makes for very awkward endings of investigations. <laughs> in my case, I'm a bit of a hothouse flower in that um, because the, the organization I work for, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, it's a nonprofit educational organization, uh, we, we, we promote scientific investigation of claims of the paranormal. Um, and of course, uh, the famous Joe Nickel, who's not here, but uh, he's you know, w one of the greatest. And he's, he is, as far as I know, the world's only sort of full-time paranormal investigator. I'm more of a part-time because my duties also include uh, doing the managing editing, the deputy editing of Skeptical Inquirer magazine, um, and then other things as well. So in my particular case, 
Um, I don't actually have fun. like for example, Joe Nickel has a fund. He's actually uh, he's been don he's had money donated to help him do his investigations. Um, and whereas in my case, uh, the investigations that I do are, are primarily on my own, usually on my own time and my own dime. Uh, usually they're opportunist, opportunistic ones. For example, I mentioned the Popobawa. Uh, you know, I happened to be in in Zanzibar and I said, as, hey, as, you are. as one is, and <laughs> and. I could go to the beach and get it drunk, or I could go look at the skeptic raping da bat demon, and you know, there you go. So a lot of times it's sort of like you have to take take advantage of it when you can. And the other the other part of the question is, occasionally uh, the investigations are funded by TV shows. So for example, uh, you know, there's, I was on National Geographic, uh, the Is It Real series, and other ones as well. And so for example, uh, at one point we were doing an investigation of Ogopogo, the lake monster in Canada. And at first they just wanted to have me as a talking head. Like, well, can you talk to us about lake monsters? I said, yeah, I can. Wouldn't it be more interesting if you actually flew me out there to do the investigation? The guy's like, yeah, yeah, we could do that. So, so again, we're using, I'm happy, if I can do an investigation on National Geographic's uh, you know, dime, then I'm happy to do so. I really have to plug that. How many people in here have Netflix? Quite a few. Wow. National Geographic's Is It Real is on Netflix. Go and watch it again. Uh, when I was a little boy, I used to watch Ben Radford on there all the time. <laughs> so, I recommend it. And I watched you, too. <laughs> I, I should mention on the uh, subject of funding, the Independent Investigations Group is an all-volunteer group. And while the $50,000 uh, prize you know, for the, the Paranormal Challenge is backed by the Center for Inquiry, uh, the members actually pay dues. And at the Los Angeles chapter, we have 40-plus uh, members. And uh, we use those funds. But it, it's a good indicator that you can form a local group and conduct investigations just based on volunteerism and you know, enthusiasm for the subject. I just wanted to get back to the questions briefly, uh, to methodologies. Uh, what resources do you use for your investigations? Well, you know, that, that is a, a, a great question. Resources, uh, we're going to look at as being um, things like uh, the internet, uh, which you have to be very careful because you don't know always how good your source is there. Uh, the library, um, eyewitness accounts. When, when it comes down to it, we have to get back to that thing about uh, credentials you know, and, and what, uh, what kind of training do do we really have to be paranormal investigators? Well, the truth is, is you don't need to have any credentials, but what you do have to have is friends that know stuff. Um, and, and we're lucky because we have several. We have, uh, when we get stuck on certain things, we can call up Banachek and bother him. And uh, he's been very great uh, in terms of uh, giving advice when it comes to us maybe needing to see things from a different perspective. Um, we've actually bothered uh, James Randi on occasion. Uh, we have several medical doctors that we call uh, to see if there's certain conditions, uh, psychiatrists. And uh, a big one, we, we actually have Stuart Robbins here. He's a, a planetary geophysicist, and I love that title. Uh, but he's absolutely brilliant, and we're able to get so much good information from these guys. You cannot uh, be an island if you're going to be a paranormal investigator. You have to get out there and uh, make some good contacts with professionals because just about every field that you can imagine will have some aspect of it that will be valuable to you except for, well florist we haven't really figured out how that would be useful yet but most most uh, uh, I want to say applications but most uh, wow yeah. it's a ghost I'm gonna go investigate that I'll be right back a, a good example of that how many people that wanted to get into the paranormal field thought I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna go study geology <laughs> How many times have we had to call on geologists? I mean, it's been countless. Uh, to the point we actually called in the U.S. Department of Agriculture once to do a soil survey for us because it was part of our investigation. And they got really excited because they got to pretend to be ghost hunters. It, well, that's true. <laughs> but we any field, regardless of how obscure it is, seems to have some sort of a tie-in to doing one type or another of investigation. Yeah. 
we brought our own geologist to a creation museum, Dr. Donald Prothero. That was fun. <laughs> uh, but uh, s speaking of uh, resources, I mean, this meeting here, the amazing meeting, is like the collection of all the greatest resources. Skeptical Inquirer, Skeptic Magazine, um, you know, uh, Science-Based Medicine blog, you know, there's so much that gets produced out of this group here that are fantastic resources. But for our podcast, we tend to go in blind, not that we... Intentionally. Intentionally, yeah. We're, if you're drawing the difference between uh, investigation and uh, research, we'll kind of go heavy on the investigation just to get the experience of it, and then later on check in with all these other great resources and kind of see uh, what the perspective is. Yeah, I think that's kind of where our different types of investigations differ. Um, we try to do a sort of immersion reporting technique because we want to have this sort of layman's experience where you just go in the same way someone else would go into a chiropractor and see what that's like, not knowing much about it. And then um, we'll, we'll ask the practitioner exactly what the claims are and see how that stands up to science later in the game so that we have that sort of pure experience. And as a result, um, I'd say our investigations are probably much cheaper. <laughs> well, we're just gonna take a couple of questions from the audience and then move on to some uh, case studies briefly. Oh my God. They're everywhere. Eeny, meeny, meeny. Take one minute. Okay, we'll start over here. My acupuncturist, <laughs> literally, <laughs> most painful experience of my life. Yeah, uh, did everybody hear the question? Okay, it was, he was asking uh, if we've ever showed up an investigation and, and the, uh, the subject was such a believer and so fanatical that we felt that it may have been a danger to us. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, yeah. Uh, it, it does happen a lot, and I, and I think when it comes to uh, even when we're talking about these challenges, the the like the million dollar challenge, the IIG challenge, um, a lot of the times you start to wonder, will this person flip out at, by before the end of this? If they, you know, because they all they all say at the end, oh yeah, okay, I failed this time, and then 20 minutes later, like it was a setup, the whole thing was a setup, and you just never know uh, what's going to happen. So it is. It, it's almost always frightening. And I can tell you, the ghost believers to, to us are not nearly as freaky as the UFO believers. Uh, they're a lot like the conspiracy theorists and they have guns in their iron-lined basements and uh, they're, they're very scary. And we, we thought for a while we were gonna have to start wearing bulletproof vests and stuff, but uh, it, it gets a little freaky out there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, just following up what he said. That that's been my experience as well. Is I mean, I've dealt with, you know, pissed off psychics, UFO believers, you know, cryptids as well. I mean, take your pick. But by far the the <laughs> scariest folks are the UFO folks. I mean, I just anyway. <laughs> but uh, just real quick, the, the the one that comes to my mind is uh, when I was living in Buffalo. I had a guy come to me who believed he had a ghost in his neck, and he wanted me to recommend a doctor who could uh, who could put certain um, musical vibrations into his neck that would drive out the ghost. And I asked him where he got this idea that he had a ghost in his neck, and he said that he watched a lot of ghost hunters. Hmm. And uh, that was a case of where, I mean, he was a middle-aged black guy, nice guy, uh, but just clearly not all right. And I did my best to steer him towards, uh, towards counseling. But, I mean, that was, I was only slightly scared for myself, but I was more scared for him. Yeah, I would, I would say when you look at the body of skeptical literature, I, I know I get very excited about investigations and finding the solutions to mysteries, but there's a big section, of, especially look at Michael Shermer's work, uh, why do people believe weird things? Figure that out because the, the passion people have for their beliefs and the way they hold on to their beliefs is really going to have a big impact if you do investigations on how you interface with these people. Even the most casual joke about Bigfoot gets me hate mail <laughs> because I'm being dismissive, right? You know, and I, you know, it's in the puns, a little bit on the puns, but uh, it's it's yeah. It, it, if you dismiss something someone else holds to be a cherished belief, even if it's outside of religion, it could be taken like blasphemy. So just consider that. I think there are also a lot of dangers uh, with investigating pseudoscientific claims. I think probably more of those than with paranormal claims. 
uh, and I guess something that happened to us quite recently. Uh, this is a, I wrote an article about this for Swift's, uh, the JREF's blog, and it was called Surprise Cupping. And essentially what happened was um, Matthew and I went uh, back to Australia and uh, my mother paid for him to have, this is all very personal, but my mother paid for him to have a, a nice massage. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he's lying on this Not table. Not that kind of massage. No. <laughs> Stop thinking like that. Uh, so she paid for him to have a massage and uh, anyway, he's probably about 10 minutes into this and he starts feeling these heavy weights being placed on his back and he thought, is this a hot stone massage or something like that? And then he feels them being moved around on his back and then suddenly he hears this popping sound. So this practitioner uh, was cupping his back and hadn't even cleared that with him, hadn't asked for permission at all, just decided to perform this procedure on him. And that's, uh, of course, extremely dangerous. We basically got home afterwards and, and I said, well, how was the massage? And he said, look, don't tell your mum, but look. And he lifts up his shirt and he's covered in bruises. So I think that, uh, that there are a lot of dangers associated with investigating the, uh, the pseudoscientific claims. And I think uh, Ross would have to agree with me there with his recent colonic irrigation. Yes, there's a reason our motto is we show up so you don't have to. Uh, we do not encourage people to always undergo the things that we do. Um, and there is a calculated risk to it, for sure. Um, and that's uh, something to be aware of, you know, the possible side effects. Um, ear candling was another one uh, because there is a burning candle in your ear. And, um, and it's not pulling earwax out of your ear, we found out. So... Um, yeah, uh, proceed with caution or do not proceed at all with those kinds of claims. Well, one thing about the pseudoscientific claims is there's a lot more uh, possibility for lawsuits as well. Because usually with that, you're attacking some sort of a business. Uh, we witnessed that not too long ago with a business that had a uh, magic box that will cure autism and cancer and all sorts of other things. And the minute that we brought it up, uh, luckily one of the local news stations went with us but the threats of lawsuits once again come up. And these people mean business because you aren't just attacking their belief, you're attacking their source of income. And that is a very serious thing to do to people, but we're just the people to do that. Interestingly though, the only people who have threatened legal action against Ross and myself are the Raelians. No pseudoscience practitioners. No death threats. We try to Have be we gotten very, death threats? Very the day is young. No, <laughs> no death threats yet. We're not asking for any. Right. <laughs> but Tam does have a survey at the end, so you can write that in if you want. <laughs> is that one of the options? Right. <laughs> Did you just ask me how do we go and investigate a haunting legitimately? <laughs> well, what, what, and, and admittedly, uh, since, you know, when it comes to people calling us and going out and doing haunt, uh, haunting investigations, the way we do it is slightly different than the way Ben Radford does it. So we're going to let him uh, also say what he does here in a couple of minutes, and then we'll have a, a Jello wrestling finale on that. Um, but uh, what, what we tend to do is we do historical research on the address of the place. Uh, we try to go back and see if there's any other uh, claims or if there's anything that's happened to the place that may cause the claims that, that the people are having. So we try to do as much behind the scenes research as possible. We find out from the people, uh, have they ever had these kind of activities in their life before, anywhere else they lived? That way we can get a little bit of an idea on who we're dealing with mentally. Um, we'll go uh, to their place of residence and, and interview them and have them show us a round of, you know, uh, what it was that happened and, and how it happened and try to get a good idea uh, Walk around and survey the area take a good look um, And then what we do we do what uh, most skeptics hate we do the stakeout We do go and spend the night with the people we bring EMF detectors we bring uh, Temperature gauges we bring cameras video cameras. We do all that stuff and uh, it's not to catch a ghost. That's the thing that differentiates us from the TV crowd. We don't go there to catch a ghost. We go there to catch them hoaxing. We go there to catch what the actual natural 
uh, uh, problem may be. And if we can catch that on video, we can show it to them and say, see, uh, we've had cases where um, there have been, uh, uh, let's say, areas in the house that have had such a high EMF reading from a defect, defective uh, compressor on a refrigerator or something like that, that uh, we're finding, uh, you know, or bearings go out on things, and it sounds like there's a conversation coming from the other room because of bearings out in the other room. Um, but So we'll, we'll try to use these things both for documentation, not to find ghosts, but documentation, and um, we like to also use the, the EMF detectors and stuff to show the other groups that they're not effective for finding ghosts. You know, when we've got all this data to say, see, no ghosts, and yet the EMF that we recorded is the same as what you recorded, but you came to the conclusion of ghosts and we didn't. So we use it for kind of two different reasons there. Um, anything to add on that? A, a key no, thing. That's good. A key thing to remember is that they are having experiences, but how can we reframe this and look at those experiences? Uh, you know, there's often exactly. a real explanation that you can find and try to break them apart because they'll take all these little things that are happening and, and uh, meld them together. For example, we went to a, a house in West Hollywood and this a young woman had been worried about all these things. One was ectoplasm. She had come up with that word and she said it would aggregate in the center of her kitchen. And so we said, okay, well, let's look at the slope of the kitchen. Let's put, we, we could see the trail. Let's put some other liquid here. Oh, look, it's flowing to the same spot. That's the lowest spot in your kitchen. And we then traced it to the back of her fridge. There was a, a coil that was going outside of a collection pan and it was just dripping water and that was picking up gunk on the kitchen floor. And voila, you have ectoplasm, something a little stickier than water at, at the end result. She'd had a light fixture fall down. Well, that was completely unrelated. We showed that the, the, the glass, or it was plastic, uh, thankfully not glass, didn't fit too well in the, the wood casing for the light fixture. So then she was relieved by that. She talked about smelling fingernail polish and we asked her if any of her neighbors had been painting. Sure enough, the next door neighbor had repainted their, well, you know, might have had the same kind of base as, as a fingernail polish. Uh, her phone had been misfunctioning. Uh, so it, it was all these things totally unrelated, but she had created a narrative out of them and it had made her worried. But when one by one we just kind of answered those specific claims and honored her experience, she was happy and content with the result. I would say, yeah, that's absolutely. Look at the claims like we talked about before. Also, you got to consider the null hypothesis. Make sure there's something really going on, right? I mean, not just in saying is this story true or not, but uh, a, a really common problem, uh, I think, with skepticism is uh, you, you, you hear a story and you think, oh, that's probably not what's happening. I bet it's this. And you come up with a plausible explanation in your head. And sometimes those are really great and they seem very plausible. But sometimes they have nothing to do with what's really going on because nothing's going on. So you really need to take that, that extra step and see if anything's actually really happening. Really good point. Yeah. Well, I think I speak for Ben and I when uh, our investigation styles are very similar and we'll do a lot of historical background research uh, and write up a lot of the stories as folklore and, and often you'll find, I've investigated most of the major claims in this country uh, regarding haunted houses, the Winchester Mystery House, uh, Alcatraz, um, the Waverly Hills Sanitarium and uh, often you'll find that when you do good historical research uh, you can debunk the claims and often people who are reputed to haunt a particular house never existed or never went to that place. Uh, you've had a, a couple of stories like that too. So I think uh, that that's a good technique to take to, uh, to do your historical research. But uh, we're sort of running low on time and we wanted to look at a couple of case studies for you all. So Blake, if you'd like to... Well, I'm just gonna... <laughs> oh, <laughs> can yeah. I read them? Let me just explain what's going on here. You know, we didn't know how many people were going to be here. So we wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of think through some um, uh, hypothetical situations. These are hypothetical, but they're, they're, not, um, they're not completely unlike real events that have happened. So, yeah, let's see if it comes up okay. on the screen. And let's see. Okay. Yay. Yeah, all right. So I don't think I can actually read this. Okay, let's see. So, um, so, <laughs> so, so this, uh, this is uh, the weeping statue. Um, a news story catches your eye. It seems that visitors to the gardens of St. Barry the White have reported that a statue to the venerated saint weeps every morning. 
The report says that a child first noticed the phenomena and now visitors from the area are crowding into the gardens every morning and placing the tears on sick people. Some have reported feeling healed after the experience. A woman says that the tears have cured her lengthy illness. I've been feeling terrible for more than a year, but as I prayed before the statue, a friend put the tears on my forehead and I suddenly felt better. The three foot tall marble statue was placed in the gardens last winter, but nobody reported the phenomenon until this spring. The gardens are open Monday through Saturday, Monday through Saturday. No admission necessary, but donations are welcome. So, so this is the kind of, uh, I think this kind of claim uh, is pretty common. Um, they kind of pop up all over the country of uh, relics or uh, holy events that people think are miraculous. And if, you're, uh, if this happens in your community and you want to go do a case study, <clears throat> this is the kind of thing you might see or experience. So... Um, does anybody, <laughs> I really am a challenge to how to approach this, but if anybody wants to talk about how they might uh, want to, and that includes the panel if they want to, but uh, how you would start with this sort of a case. Love power. Love power. Love power? It's love power. Well, hey, case solved. Well, well I guess we're done. All right. All right. Next. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, these exactly. You're thinking on the right lines, you know. So, so <laughs> those are some thick tears. <laughs> Birds with diarrhea. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. He's, he's talking about possibly putting another experiment, having a similar statue, and see if you get the same effect in the same area. So. Uh, the, the woman who claimed she was healed, find out if she had a confirmed diagnosis by a medical professional, find out if she was undergoing any conventional treatment, which would be more likely to cause what was going on. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I gave her an illness that was very vague. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. I, but... Has anyone tested? That's a great question. Is it, have, have they tested them if they're real tears? Right? Also, look at the child. I mean, the child reported. Is there a name of the child? Can you talk to the child and say, well, what did you actually see? Oh, these are great. You guys are thinking exactly the right way. These are great questions. So, uh, Go forth and investigate. You guys are great. Yeah, you, you're <laughs> done. I was like, <laughs> so, <laughs> way. so Well, it's interesting it's, because I, mean, I think with these, the, you. you the, you can't necessarily know whether this is a, just from the story, whether this is a, a, a legitimate physical phenomena that just like, is it due, is it, is it something from a sprinkler, or is it a pious fraud, is someone at the church actually, you know, helping this along to help, you know, uh, the vagueness of the story that there's no names with the people. I'd left that there not to hide it, but because I see stories like this all the time where a person said, a woman said, a boy said, and there's no names associated with it. And if you dig, you may discover there's no such person at all. That's just a story. But it, that, those are great questions. Good job, guys. So let's move on to the next one. Sorry, go ahead. Um, well, you'd go in at night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Turn out all the lights. <laughs> I, th this is actually, I think, uh, religious claims like this, where, where there's a, a miracle involved, no matter what the, the uh, this is hypothetical. I don't know what this is, but <laughs> whoever worships Barry White. Um, the the, the uh, religious claims can be really challenging, though, because uh, if it's in the best interest financially for the institute or place that has this phenomena going on, they may not want you to come and investigate. I know that uh, although Joe Nichols, Nichols not here to say it, he's had to do uh, some sneaky reaching around and touching things in, in, uh, in order to get these kind of investigations done. And, uh, statues, <laughs> statues. So. <laughs> Another Sorry. reason he's not here this yeah. year. <laughs> All right. So this is what I call pitching a series. Uh, you hear on the radio that a ghost hunter group is filming a TV episode in your hometown. Apparently, there's an active haunting that involves a ghost which throws things. The haunting is allegedly centered around a 13-year-old boy who's a foster kid. He was put into foster care after his parents were both arrested for dealing meth, and a few weeks later, began to break th or things began to break around the house. The foster parents have five kids in total, but the problem only manifests when the new kid's present. 
Reported activity includes silverware flying across the room, furniture moving, his bed shaking. Some versions of this story say it levitated, and at least one photo which shows a TV remote control flying past his face. He's not been seriously injured, but at least three times the flying objects have hit him. The foster parents have publicly pleaded for assistance from any paranormal investigators who can help. They say they're skeptical about ghosts, but are at a loss to explain the phenomena. <laughs> that may be a, yeah, there, you know, the, the kids' uh, health and safety is, is definitely something to be considered. So. Yeah. Hidden camera. Hid, hidden camera would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they'll let you in, yeah. So. Hidden cameras can be difficult with minors. Yeah. They did. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. In this particular case, they're going to let you investigate. So a uh, hidden camera would be great. Uh, so, any other ideas? So, go ahead. When it says flying objects hit him. Yes. It doesn't say flying objects hit him and there was no one throwing them. They came off it's true. It doesn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, th this, this case is, is uh, loosely based on the Tina Resch poltergeist case. Uh, and and in, in that case, uh, uh, Randy tried to investigate. I think he was prevented from doing uh, the, the job he wanted to do. But it turned out in that case, uh, evidence seemed to suggest Tina Resch was throwing things herself and causing this. Um, so in, in, in this particular scenario, um, you're, you're right, the best way to Actually, since this is kind of a hot situation, you, it would be if you could get in there with cameras and look around, if you could hide cameras and not let anybody know it, that would also be great. Um, I, when I wrote this secretly, I, I thought it would be kind of fun if the, the, the actual cause was one of the other kids was throwing stuff at this new guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that, was, yeah, that was how I kind of imagined it. But, but yeah, th I think there were challenges in the Resch case in particular that, that um, we, we talked about it on Monster Talk where the, the parents didn't want uh, any skeptics coming in and then uh, the, the paranormal investigator or well he was uh, yeah William Rawl he's passed away now but uh, yeah. yeah I'm not so sure about the ethics of that case so oh good one yeah I like that I was to talk to the parents. It would be a little tricky if they're in jail, but yeah, yeah. Probably to, to find out if anything had happened before. Yeah. Did the phenomena exist before he moved to the new house? Yeah. To find out what, if anything is actually happening, you could interview the, the kids separately to find out if the stories are all the same. Sorry. <laughs> Good example. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> to find out what, if anything is actually happening, you could interview the kids separately to see if the stories are all the same. Yes, exactly. Oh, really good idea. Yeah, exactly, because the, the inconsistencies in the story. We're assuming, I think, that things are actually happening because I've said there was a photograph, but you're right. You're saying to uh, interview the kids separately. Separately, right, exactly. So, Stuart. I have a question, actually, about the ethics of something like this, where you said with the real case that the parents didn't want skeptics groups involved, they're calling the paranormal investigators. In that type of case, would you, if you're familiar with it and there, well, it's ongoing, would that be a case where you should call Child Protective Services and say, look, there's something going on here and they don't want people who actually know what might be going on investigating. You really need to step in here. You know, I don't, I, I, this is tricky and I don't know the answer. The, the, with, with this case, I mean, as skeptics, if we heard the story on the news, I think we could call Child Protective Services and ask. The foster care system has its own, you know, local controls within each state. Um, Ray, were you involved in that case at all, the, the Tina Resch case? No. No? Okay. So I, I, read, I read Randy's original reports back in, in Skeptical Inquirer, and I don't remember if they approached the, the foster care system. I don't remember that being a part of the story. I think they were hampered so much that was a bigger factor was they weren't allowed to investigate. And William Roll, uh, you know, really felt that Tina had supernatural powers and so was trying to protect her from the dirty, stinking skeptics. So, you say your yeah. Neighbor, yeah. And your next door neighbor comes over and you're just talking with him and say, well, yeah, this, you know, my foster 
son being attacked by these demons, and I just had this ghost group over, but, you know, there are these other people. Well, it sounds crazy when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but part of the problem is that there's lots of people who raise their kids with really weird beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, whatever else. And at some point, you could easily be accused of religious persecution. Uh, you know, where you've got somebody who's like, you know, my, you know, because you've got holy rollers, you know, fundamentalists who absolutely believe that there are demons and devils at work in the world. And you know, there's a fine line between teaching your kids what you truly believe that again, there's demons and devils and Armageddon's any day now, and uh, and th ghost thing like that. So you have to be careful. So, yeah. No, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to America. Oh, for the, sure. Right. The, the problem is that, that simply convincing your child that there's a ghost in the house isn't abuse, de facto. But saying your kid's being beaten up or... Oh, sure. Yeah, if there's, if there's physical or sexual abuse, then sure. But, I mean, again, it's sort of... Yeah. yeah if if they tend tricky. to not listen, you can always just call Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society. <laughs> we can get under the radar and get in there and find out for sure. <laughs> I, I didn't realize having the kid actually get struck was going to be such a big factor. I, I could edit this right now and we could fix it. <laughs> but I, I think that also brings up a good point about the sincerity of the claim. If, if a parent says, my child is being beat up in my house, I think my house is possessed or, or haunted, and instead of moving the hell out, they call a paranormal investigation group. I mean, if I honestly thought my kid was being beat up in my house for whatever reason, I would be out of there that night. I've seen Poltergeist. That documentary sets it right. You can tell. <laughs> well, one thing you really need to watch out for, though, is if they're just calling in paranormal research groups, they may also be looking for people bringing TV cameras. So they may have apt actually brought up the claim. These might not be happening. This could be something very minor. They might not be anything at all, but because they want exposure to the media, they'll make up the claims. And we get that a lot where we'll show up at a house and they'll say, well, where are the TV cameras? Because everybody must be a TV show. And unfortunately, that's really started to ramp up the claims. In the back? In the white shirt? No. <laughs> wow, well, who are you talking about? Yeah, that, that one right there. The, oh, the, <laughs> you, yeah. Why did you let that woman ask that question? I don't know. <laughs> so Security. The, quest the question is, uh, when you go into these investigations, how much do you disclose? Do you come in and say, I'm a skeptic? Or do you come in and say, I'm doing a podcast? Do you come in and say, I don't really believe what you're saying. I'm kind of skeptical of it, but I'm going to check it out. So. We, we don't. We, we come in and say, we're here to find the truth. Uh, we, we don't necessarily do the Jason and Grant thing. Hey, we're here to help. Uh, we're, we're here to find the truth. We're here to, t to look at your claim, look at the evidence, and then we're going to tell you what we find. We don't come in and say, we're skeptics, um, because skeptic is an incredibly dirty word to a believer, so we don't use that word. We'll, we'll do something along the lines of you know, the Alpha Project maxim. You know, if they ask you pointedly, hey, wait a second, what are you actually doing here? Well, then we'd be honest. But in the meantime, we're busy asking questions and... Um, you know, being honest with our questions, but not uh, stating our intent or our perspective, ho hoping to be convinced, you know, perhaps if they have something uh, legitimate or convincing. As you investigate, as you investigate them, are they investigating you like, you know, uh, people on the media find out you're a parent or a after, say, well, I'm just wondering, you're like, <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's amazing. People do not do their research at all. Um, so there's, there's times that if people had actually looked us up, uh, they wouldn't have called us. And they never do. Yeah, we just use the, the, the statement, just trust us. 
Yeah, well, we use our real names, and uh, and actually, uh, with our investigation of the Mormon Church, which we joined and were baptized into, um, they uh, changed their policy with new applicants, where they do a background check now. <laughs> so. Good <work>. Yeah. <laughs> we. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was never a temple Mormon. You have to faithfully tithe for a year, but I still play circle ball with all the elders. It's awesome. And they, and they offered me a special temple recommend because I was so sincere. They said they would give me one early because of my sincerity. We'll often, actually, this is a funny thing, um, you know, with both the Raelians and the Mormons and a few other groups, they'll say, you know, we're so happy to see the caliber of new people coming in here. You guys are so smart and ask such great questions. And we'll feel a little bad, like, oh, we're not really. It's like, we have a few more scenarios, but we have no time. So let me, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put together the rest of this stuff into a, uh, a PDF package, along with some notes and some excerpts from Ben's book. Um, which is available for sale across the hall. Actually, he's got more than one, but there's a paranormal investigation book, which is fantastic. If you want to become an investigator, you should read it, um, or at least buy it. It has right? sections with, uh, with, with, with Randy and, and Karen and Blake as well. It's a great book. All right. So, so I want to thank everybody for coming. This has been a great thing. Thank you for everyone on the panel. Okay. Oh, yeah. the, uh, the, the PDF will be on randy.org. So, thank you very much. And... Um, that was my gateway doubt. That was, the, that was the, the, all these stories that I knew from my hometown were, you know, absolutely true. It suddenly found out that they were all just uh, urban legends. And, you know, if those really important foundation stories weren't true, what else wasn't true? And that's how I got here. So. I sort of had my, my, uh, my introduction to it through more or less formalized skepticism um, through the, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and Skeptical Inquiry magazine. In fact, the very first skeptical piece I ever uh, read was, once again, uh, Randy's piece. Um, I was, um, it's a long, long story, but in, in, in a nutshell, I, I was looking for beer in a dry county in Utah, <laughs> as one does. And, um, and I happened to come across a used bookstore, and there in this used bookstore was a bunch of, it was Mormon area, so it was, you know, how to live in your basement for 20 years and how to juggle five wives and all that. But beside that was an old copy of Skeptical Inquirer magazine in which uh, James Randi was doing a, a beautifully eviscerating job at, at debunking Nostradamus. I'd never seen that before. I'd heard of Nostradamus, read about him, but I'd never seen anybody like, take this point and say, oh my God, <laughs> this, is, this is amazing stuff. And at that point, I went on. So at that point, I got more involved in, in, in uh, PSYCOP at the time of what's now CSI. And so I was fortunate enough to have predecessors like Randy and Joe Nickel, Ray Hyman, uh, Robert Schaefer, Phil Klass, Richard Wiseman, uh, and others um, who I could, you know, sort of look at the history of, of you know, the, the actual quasi-formalized investigation. And so I, I could sort of draw upon it from that. So that's how I got into it. So I wanted to talk next about how we choose a topic or a theme. And uh, often I just come across uh, anything that's in the local media, popular news stories at the time. Uh, a lot of people approach me as well and say, why don't you investigate this particular topic? So how do you choose a topic, guys? How do you choose a place to investigate? Well, it's easy for us because we have pushy Facebook fans who tell us what to investigate. Well, we have a long list, and uh, you put it all together, and we, we do a podcast once a month about a new investigation, and we have at least six, six, years, six years worth of, of material. There, there's no limit to the amount of societies to join. And we're just going to tell you these claims. And, and I, I, after a few years of that, I, I was saying, no, hold on. I'm not, I'm not willing to accept somebody said. I want to know. I want to investigate. And so that's, that's where when I turned from dabbling uh, skeptic or dabbling believer into more of a skeptic, deciding I wanted to decide for myself and find out, you know, what was, what was behind the claims. So I got started in investigations working with a, an organization called the Australian Skeptics. I actually uh, began doing work experience with them and uh, they wanted me to to play, I guess, a Matahari in a sense, and uh, I went to see a number of uh, alternative practitioners, an aura reader, a, a homeopath, uh, a naturopath, and, and other practitioners, 
and uh, they, I, I had a consultation with all of them and they all told me I had a thyroid condition or some kind of problem with my liver and so they all gave me diagnoses and then I went and uh, saw a, a medical practitioner afterwards who disconfirmed a lot of those. So that's how I got started as an investigator after that. Uh, I guess people would approach me and say, why don't you investigate this particular topic? And, and so it went on. So I'm curious to find out how, every, how everyone here became an investigator to begin with. What inspired you? How did you start? Well, for me, I was 11 years old when I first saw The Exorcist. <laughs> Needless to say, it scared the crap out of me. Now, uh, I believe that she was 13 in that movie when she was possessed by the devil. And I thought, okay, I'm 11 years old. I got two years. <laughs> so I started studying everything I could find. And uh, through studying, you know, I thought, know your enemy. You know, try to find out everything you can about this, this, you know, these evil entities that are out there to get us all. And as I started reading, I started seeing, wait a minute, everybody's got conflicting information that they're putting forth as facts. Um, this didn't make sense. So pretty soon I figured out the only way I'm going to truly know about this stuff is if I get out there and investigate it myself and find out what the, tra the facts really are. Because I realized all I was reading was opinion. I was kind of the same way, but I really wanted to dive in and investigate firsthand what's going on, what are people witnessing. So I unfortunately decided I'd go out and get involved in the local research community. Uh, if anybody's done that, you know exactly where I'm going with this. It was a really bad experience because it was primarily a bunch of believers confirming what they were there to research. Uh, which kind of uh, forced me to start my own group. And luckily enough, I've had other people join me that have really helped throughout the years. Next. <laughs> hey. Um, so I really found skepticism through the Skeptic Society in Pasadena. Luckily, that was nearby, and I started attending those uh, lectures in college. And then I found that uh, CFI was also nearby, so there were a lot of resources and a community in Los Angeles. And there they had the Independent Investigations Group. And uh, having kind of recently discovered that I had been wrong about the world, or at least as I saw it, um, I was really excited that I could convert all my interest in these stories, uh, in these myths, and actually investigate them firsthand. And so uh, it was really through the independent investigations group that I started actively um, you know, testing paranormal claims. Um, this is where I pat James Randi on the back for the third time during this panel. Um, but I, I saw a homeopathy video that uh, Randi did um, back when I was taking homeopathy. And I was taking it for headaches, chronic headaches, and uh, my boyfriend at the time said, um, do you know what this stuff is? I just looked this up online, it's crazy. And sent me a link to a Randy video. And from there, I started thinking about all the other things that um, I had been trying that people had always told me didn't have evidence behind them. And I had never really listened to those people. Um, and something about that video just snapped in me and I, I uh, wanted to, to look into everything more and question on a deeper level. pass this thing around. I think I'm going to probably butcher his name, but um, when, when I was doing my investigations into UFOs, I did a UFO road trip after the Heaven's Gate cult tragedy and just decided to go see some of these places myself. And on the way, I stopped at a library in Gulf Breeze, Florida, and there was a book sale while I was there looking at evidence for uh, UFO information. And, and the book was uh, one of, was it Jan Harold Brunvand, if, if I said that right? Thank you for coming along today. Welcome to this uh, workshop, Investigative Methods for the Skeptic. Uh, we've got a whole panel here of people, uh, very seasoned in, uh, in conducting investigations and uh, a lot of combined experience here. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to ask some questions and uh, everyone on the panel is going to answer them. Uh, my name's Karen Stoltzner. I'm one of the research fellows for the James Randi Educational Foundation. Uh, I'm also a co-host of the Monster Talk podcast. Um, so I'll just get everyone to introduce themselves briefly and then, then we'll start. I guess that would be me. Uh, I'm Brian Bonner. I'm with the Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society and Warning Radio. 
Matthew Baxter. I'm a paranormal claims investigator with Rocky Mountain Paranormal Research Society and uh, with Warning Radio. I'm Benjamin Radford, deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine and a uh, research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I'm uh, Blake Smith. I'm with IAG Atlanta and the Monster Talk podcast. I'm Ross Blotcher, a longtime member of the Independent Investigations Group and um, part of the Oh No, Ross and Carrie podcast. Hello, I'm Carrie Poppy. I'm the other half of the Ono Ross and Carey podcast, and I'm also the communications director for the James Randi Educational Foundation. Well, thanks, everyone. So I grew up in Australia, and I feel like I've always been a skeptic, but I was curious to find out if everyone on the panel has always identified as being a skeptic or whether you be began out as a, a believer. So I'd just like to start with that question. I can't say that I've always identified as a skeptic. I've always had that mindset, but actually the label isn't something that came until later on. I definitely spent a lot of time being a believer. Uh, I grew up a believer. And uh, the, the problem is, is, is I actually had more than two brain cells to rub together and eventually found my way to skepticism. And uh, I, I really, really have to thank James Randi for that because I got to go back through his readings. And also, if anyone wants to pipe up at any time, it, we don't have to answer in a, a linear oh. fashion at all. Oh, one thing I do want to bring up. Uh, we're going to try to run this workshop a little bit like a skeptic camp. If any of you have been to a skeptic camp, that means that any time you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. You don't have to wait to the end. We're, we're ready all the time. There's actually a bribe here as well. <laughs> there is but we won't bring it up just yet. Okay. All right, I'm gonna break the linear format. I was very much a believer. I was raised a Bible-believing Christian, still kind of a chapter and verse guy, and, um, and yet I still managed to buy every ghost and alien encrypted book and believe almost everything I read in it. Uh, so definitely a believer for a long time until my college years. I'm going to cheat and say I've been both forever. Um, I think I was a skeptic when I was a believer. Like Ross, we both share a believer history, which is what made us friends originally. Um, but uh, even when I was a believer, I always cared about evidence. And I think I just didn't have all the evidence yet. Um, and that's something that I like to emphasize when talking to believers as well, that we need to treat them as, as thinking individuals just as we are. And, um, I. I think I became uh, a full-blown skeptic after the Heaven's Gate cult. Uh, I think I'd taken things a little not very seriously and then decided to get to the bottom of stuff. And then found my tribe in about 2007. So for 10 years I was investigating and just trying to find answers for myself. And I'm really happy to find this sort of community where we can share information. It's nice. In my case, uh, I grew up uh, in my early teens uh, being sort of a, a dabbling believer or a dabbling skeptic. I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends on half empty, half full type thing. But, you know, I, I, I would read uh, books and magazines and I would see TV shows, you know, That's Incredible, which dates me, and, and others here. Um, and, you know, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, all of us, Arthur C. Clarke, Strange World. And I would see these shows and, and they, were all, they were all presented very factually and authoritatively. But I never I noticed that that there was very little actual investigation. It was just sort of like somebody said.